there was a man named Helgi, son of Iceland in general and Frithjon the Punk in particular. Helgi was a most important Viking. Helgi Saga. The play takes place in 985, 1985 and 10,985 simultaneously with thumb osmosis from circa minus 985. Some of the characters are real people. None of the names have been changed. Everyone was innocent. Any motives hiding behind absurdity might not be. The other thing. Iceland Ancient Parliament thing fella. I should be all right, all right. Put away your puffins and pin your ears back. This is the final session of this thing. And soon you'll all be on your way back to your farms and families. Settle down now. There is only two items remaining on this agenda. The first, Iceland's legal claim to all America. And the second item is uh, the nomination of Helki, son of Fridion, as life minister of postage stamps dried and dead fish and idle folk and specific other waiters. One vote covers both issues. What do I hear? Good, good. Both motions passed. Back to the beer tent. The Ministry of ED and SOW, Reykjavik, Iceland. Helgi slashed a path to the door of his ministry through the assembled orcs. He wiped the blood from his axe with the coat of the doorman, hung his leather cap with sewn in pigtails on the Grecian temple hat stand just inside the door, and squeezed into his office past the 40 Argentinian albatrosses awaiting repatriation. When Helgi had moved into this office, he had refused all furnishings, saying that he was quite capable of drinking standing up. But the Minister of Public Buildings and Works insisted on putting a bench in there anyway, because he had a cousin who made office-sized benches. Sitting on this bench in the office was a messenger from Helgi's cousin, Skrithi. The messenger stood up as Helgi entered. Good greetings from my master Skrede to his cousin and friend Helgi. Great. Next! There's more. I've been on urgent message from Skrede, which is for your ears only. Good. Thank you, Sean. Uh, bring an extra cup, will you? Get it your bloody self. It's, it's all right, sir. I'll deliver my message and return to my master directly. Just a moment. 
This spear should ensure that nobody is listening at the door. Ah, oh, holy mother of God, what the f*** was that? Very well, tell me from the top. My master Skridi, Icelandic ambassador to the court of Europe, now lies abed with comfortless headache in the house of his wife. He would have you now... Skridi's last assignment had been to inform the English monarch Spokestack that Iceland had extended its territorial waters to include Cyprus and Hawaii. Spokestack was hoping that the Icelanders would tell his magicians the processes necessary to produce iron in exchange for his ready cooperation in anything that they asked. He was willing to sign a pledge that the process would not be used to make weapons, complete with a no first strike clause. Skrithi could not read and hacked two-thirds of the king's family to fill it and fed that to the royal ferrets as a diversion from the embarrassment of his inadequacy. All in all, King Spokestax took these events well and the two men parted on good terms. These diplomatic niceties having taken less time than originally estimated, my master Skridi had a few days to spare and so decided to call on Jona on his way home. It was there, whilst collecting a candle broom for a concubine, that he suddenly fell seriously ill with an attack of split skull. The chief of Iona was a man named Father Abbotson. He was a simple man who, to avoid confusion, worshipped only one god and had his runes nailed to the wall. Father Abbotson was on his knees thanking his god for the apparent divine intervention during the last Viking raid. A novice sat by candlelight in the cellar polishing the dents in his censer. And it is because of his present incapacity that Skridi asks that you, Helgi, don the diplomatic robe and undertake his forthcoming assignment. Well, of course I'm very busy here. But winter's not more than a week away, and I wouldn't mind a voyage to other climes. Uh, what's the assignment? Cultural attacks and second executioner secretary at the court of King Wayflot in Norway. Hmm. I've done worse jobs. Very well. Tell Skriti that I will make plans to leave immediately. In the Watcher's Spaceship. Two light years, give or take a jiff, away from the Andra Mara constellation, and the Watcher's spacecraft ran into trouble. In fact, it ran out of fuel. Assuming you are aware of the magnitude of space, you will understand that it took some considerable time before the Watchers realized that their craft had stopped moving even though they had been travelling previously at only six miles per hour slower than the speed of light. No dear, the flesh is Has anyone else noticed that the ankle through the breeze has suddenly ceased? Fallowfield, an earthling guest of the Watchers, refused the fifth chocolate digestive biscuit, and being the only one among them with a brow, assumed a concerned frown. Dear, dear, dear. This is no time for your bouncy toes, Fallowfield. This is the time to bounce. In the time it takes to cook chicken in black bean sauce in a volcano on Io, all the watchers started rattling towards self-vivisection. All, of course, except Watcher 4 who could only muster an irritated hum in an important address in the collective ROM. Well, I say important, but in fact, AND 999-364563 to infinity loop x divided by y comma, those being the addresses in question, controlled the intensity of the light in the self-cleaning odorless ashtray. 
The colour itself was the responsibility of an address in Watcher 2E and was a randomised selection with parameters generated by detecting from the smoke the nature of the material being burned. Of course, you'd have to go a lot further down the street to locate the bits that actually got the ashtray to open. Watcher 7, controller of openings, swore that that section of his system had been short-circuited by Saturnian static. The others would have it that he was just being a misery because he had given up smoking. This is serious. The smoke coming from the grill and the smell of burning crumpets means that even mother computers are agitated. Come on, panic isn't going to get us any further than empty fuel tank. The ashtray opened and closed several times, each time emitting a different coloured flash. Fallowfield lifted the front of his sacred t-shirt and unscrewed the diamond from his navel. Here, this should get us back to Earth. Watcher 4 screwed a beer glass onto its visi sensor and examined the stone. Well, the stone itself will supply constant power for an Earth decade, but your belly button fluff will generate enough energy to blast us three times around the cosmos in a week. That's really fast. <laughs> At the assembly point of Wafloff's army, Norway. Helgi arrived at the court of King Wafloff just in time for war. Identify yourself. I hate to kill strangers. I am Helgi, son of famed Fridion the Punk. I am the new Icelandic ambassador to the court of King Wafloff of Norway. Very well. Pass Helgi. The queue for the sword sharpener is over there. Helgi stood in the line between King Wafloff and an until recently unemployed mercenary from Sheffield. Using the insight gathered from a lifetime of diplomacy and pillage, he decided he didn't like either of them, but would let them both live at least until after his sword had been sharpened. I best find out what this war is about. He struck the king on the shoulder with the flat of his axe. Herdu, your majesty! Before he could say more, six of the king's bodyguards leapt at Helgi with raised weapons, intent on killing him to teach him some manners. With one sideways stroke, I sent this rude half-dozen to Odin's open arms. And not one drop of blood shall fall upon the king's fine tunic. Thank you. Thank you. Nine more of the king's best men jumped forward and attacked Helgi with sword, axe and pike. Ah, come on, fellas. Well, I'm really very tired, but if you insist... Twelve more soldiers step forward. Stop! An end to this. Good greetings to our friend Helgi, son of someone near Iceland. We see, see that, that you will be most useful, useful on the field of battle. It is good to have a warrior of your prowess fighting on our side. I have the battle strength of twenty men. Well, 
At least fifteen, I hope. Come on, come on, don't stand around. Give it here. Here you are, my man. Take great care of it. It was cast in Thor's forge, and the hilt is solid gold, inlaid with diamonds and rubies. Yeah, right. Your number is 935. Thank you. Next. Swords made in my settlement of Sheffield are superior to most, I tell you. They don't need sharpening half as often. Is that so? Aye, but I lost mine with the rest of my baggage on the journey over here. Really? Aye, now I'm having to use this borrowed blade from Zolingen. You don't say. Aye, this one needs sharpening so often that I sometimes have to break mid-battle and run home to Horn. Sure. Your number is 936. Next! Helgi pinned an Icelandic flag to his rucksack and headed for the tea tent. The Offices of the Bible, Mount Sinai. Let the scroll you scribe it over to Simon and scoot over here. Yes, Chief. I've got the assignment of your life for you, my boy. Not another split sea story, I hope. Stories like that can cast doubt on a writer's credibility. How many times have I warned you about using big words? No, it's nothing like that. This one's a big I want you to go up to the north of the north, and somewhere there's a land called Norway. Rumour has it that two kings are about to battle and I won't cover you. What's so special about two kings fighting? Oh, this one's special, all right. I saw it in the omens. You don't want to believe everything you read in chicken livers. Listen, you get yourself up there and bring me back a good story. If I like it, I guarantee you widespread circulation. Great is the number of places without names, and Fallow filled past most of them as the Watcher's spaceship hurtled haphazardly through the vastness of the universe. Is Magnus B in Amsterdam by any chance? If so, would you tell him that Fallowfield might be dropping in on him soon? No, I'll not wait. This is a long distance call. Thank you. Goodbye. The call had caused so great an energy drain on the telephone's transistors that it couldn't even raise a click when the receiver was replaced. Hi. I'll watch your this equipment will have to be replaced with an accident the base. I've been meaning to ask you about that, but I'll not do it now. The telephone was trying to keep its job by playing the national anthems of all known users of such tunes. With its one and a quarter octave range and audio envelope programmed by a tone-deaf telephone engineer's apprentice who had just burned his fire button finger having forgotten the instructions on how to recognize the handle end of a soldering iron. Your is hard number telephone. As soon as you press the telephone power, you'll be tuned to discussion on place for a sport. And their spaceship hurtled on.
en route to the battle with Werther's army. The march of King Werther's multitude of warriors stamped an ice path through the deep-lying snow. And I'm telling you that we should use the softer wax on the runners. The sledge is riding far too bumpily. No, no, no. It will be all right. Very well, but don't blame me if all these rocks for the catapult are nothing more than a load of gravel by the time we get there. Look, right, look, right, look, right, look, right, look, right. Come on, come on, pick up those feet. Whoa, why is worth a waging war? Beats me, I reckon he doesn't know himself. Beats me, I reckon he doesn't know himself. He's been leaving his wife on cliff tops overlooking waters known to feature in the navigation of marauding Moorish mariners. But even they're not that desperate, and she hasn't been plundered for years. So this isn't a holy war, then? So this isn't a holy war, then? Gee, head chew! Oh, me head's so on fire. I think I'm getting a fever. What do you expect if you walk about with that tablecloth on your head? What do you expect if you walk about with that tablecloth on your head? Watch it. Look, right, look, right, look, right, look, right, look, right, look, right. Let me hear them snowshoes biting into the ice. It's all right for him. He's on a bloody pony. I reckon it's a polar bear in a donkey's clothing. Tell us more about this war. Tell us more about this war. Well... Neither Werther's lands nor his goods are worthy of any more than passing interest, so this can't be a retaliatory strike. Do you think we'll get paid? Do you think we'll get paid? Sure, if we survive and end up on the winning side. If you ask me, Werther acts as though his ancestors were a blind epileptic elephant and a partially blown beer vat. It's true, I've seen his birth certificate. It's true. I've seen his birth certificate. Liar! There's no such thing as a birth certificate. And you can read one even if there was. The recruitment advertiser said something about the enactment of established tradition. There was a time when a man was content to attack his enemy by hurling hard words of reason at him from a safe distance. There was a time when a man was content to attack his enemy by hurling hard words of reason at him from a safe distance. Yes, but had during the passage of the centuries, the piece of paper with the original rules had been lost, assumed misfiled. Now, war's just another bloody ritual. Ah, an old ticket affair to avoid trouble between opposing supporters clubs. Silence in the ranks. Save your breath for marching. It ain't me chest that hurts, Sarge. Shut up, you horrible little Norseman. Well, I make sure you hurt Evanly all over. En route to the battle with Vaflov's army. Now, we all know that mates are great, but the relationship ends at the bedroom door, right? Helgi was missing his family and all the comforts of home and a cushy job. This is a war war by Thor. I lost my place the last time I counted my toes, and I fear I might have forfeited a few to frostbite. Well, it'll shorten time taking trimming toenails, and I'll save a few sous on shoes. Herde, your majesty, try some of my dried fish. This time. Oh no. Don't press that. No escape. No escape. Bad, bad, bad. Meanwhile, back on the Watcher's spaceship.
That's not the purpose job. I'll make the TMC. Is the caddy in the same place? Yes. If you free to attend this letter into my I.O. I'll the Thank you. Will someone stop that computer? the end of broken wire coat hanger. Brilliant! Great! Exactly what I need! What a pity I don't have one. A windy open space in Norway. This looks like the place. I'll set up my lookout position on that hilltop over there. My God, it's cold up here. I wish I'd brought an extra blanket for the camel. The tent of King Werther, a battlefield. Norway. What is all the cheering about? It hasn't even started yet. The men are cheering for your majesty. It's an oral token of their loyalty and devotion, sire. Then why are the other side also cheering? Oh, they are just glad the marching part is over, your royal highness. Great aces! A platoon of Wafflov men have outflanked our outside flankers and are headed in this direction. That's him. Grab him. Stop! Stand off, you churlish knave! Desist! Help! Oh, stop! Please stop! It isn't fair. We didn't know it had started that we weren't quite ready. Help! Help! Guards! They are snipping the ribbons of our undershirts. Oh, don't let them bleed all over the Persian floor tapestry. There's one here still alive, Your Majesty. Shall I hold him down? <coughs> <coughs> Shall I hold him down whilst you gain much fame and glory for your feats of hand-to-hand -hand combat on the field of battle? Not bad, Sergeant. Not bad. But we have a better idea. Cut off both his legs and one arm whilst we put on our armour and then we'll take him on in fair and noble combat. Would that I add one hundredth part of one hundredth part of your majesty's understanding of strategy? Oh, oh, please, please, sergeant, sir, I have got a shit. Oh, 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 oh. Do you 
think you should go through with this, sire? Don't you expose yourself to enough danger in your own home? When you allude to the Queen, Aid, you should win so respectfully. And what's that bloody sergeant at arms? Anybody in our army who can count in backwards hundreds has to be a danger, especially at pay parades. He seems a very capable young man, sire. Perhaps you should make him paymaster. Would we send our virgin daughter to study biology in Warsaw? No. When the battle really gets underway, we'll send him on a series of suicide missions. That will equate his fraction. The same battlefield in the tent of Vaflov. Tak, tak, Your Majesty. The early attack has gained us a good psychological advantage. One of the forwards is coming back now to report in. That looks like one of Werther's ribbons he carries so triumphantly in his mouth. Uh, well done, that man. Well done, that man. Well done, that man. Well done, that man. Splendid stuff. Splendid stuff. Splendid stuff. Splendid stuff. Oh, we owe all our success to the boss. His plan was brilliant. Nay, nay, lad. I'll not take all the credit. You had your hand in it. Our first hero. See that this man gets a pension if he reaches the age of 65. I'll make a note of it, Your Majesty. Horses men soon recovered their composure. They tightened up their back row defences and settled into their game plan. For an hour or two following, there was much blood and death. Some were struck deaf by the screams of the wounded, but no real advantage was gained or lost on either side. Only Wafflaff's early success separated the teams at the half-time whistle. Brian, your comments on the war so far. Well, narrator, as we can see on the monitor, most of the men are spending the paws lying down, bleeding. It's been all we expected and more, a spectacle of war at its most professional level of play. These two sides have shown immense skills and talents, and I look forward to a dramatic second-half battle. I'd like to point out to the listeners that, although the teams have made full use of the whole area of the pitch, some patches of grass still look good enough to eat. Narrator. Thank you, Brian. Computer, do you have the correct score? The correct score is not available. The programmers are engaged on running a small T-10. Acorn computers, thank you. The two kings and their barons walked amongst their men, giving tactical advice and urging them on to greater slaughter. A megalomaniac press baron with monopolistic motives invited both kings to hold a summit conference in his offices. So, with great pomp and ceremony, the kings met in a hurriedly erected, but nonetheless splendid, tent in the centre of the battlefield. There, between their assembled armies, these two wise monarchs held private counsel with one another. A tent in the middle of a battlefield, Norway. Greetings, cousin. We seem to be at the center of yet another historic occasion. Well, you know us, Virtus. Never want to shirk our regal duties. More wine. Battle brings out the thirst in us. Tell us, Wolfie, did you get the scroll we sent you from Constantinople? Why, yes. Thank you for the kind thought. How is the queen, by the way? We are thinking of sending her to colonize Rocco. Hmm, a precipitous undertaking. But let us get down to business. What of our war? Well, we've seen better. A distinct lack of ferocity, we would say. Agreed, agreed. And all this screaming? Most unsporting. It frightens the horses. And Odin knows what the people who live round here must think. Dreadful. It's our responsibility to correct this affair of states, state of affairs. Therefore, 
We find it necessary to decree that the second half is to be conducted with the sound turned off. Yes, consider that decree decreed. And we decree furthermore that it is decreed that every soldier is to have one leg tied behind his back to make the battle more entertaining to watch. Are you going to Lourdes this year, Werthers? The start of the second half was delayed for 20 minutes whilst both sides slaughtered the supporters who had spilled out onto the pitch and started a separate skirmish. Eventually order was restored and the whistle of flight after flight of plutonium-tipped arrows signalled the restart of the battle proper. Many were the feats of daring and skill of men from both sides, but it is the name of Helgi that will be remembered for 10,000 generations of memories. Mighty men marvelled at his mastery and then trembled should his temper turn its attention towards them. The great ace Thor had to put his receipt and dispatch department on overtime. Helgi stood in centre field, fine chopping anything that came within swinging distance. With his free hand, he stirred the finest cuts in a wok and tossed the now subtle spice scraps to the circling flock of Laris Marinus, who were the replacements for the ravens that usually served as post-battlefield clearers. Despite Helgi's superhuman effort, as evening drew nigh, it became apparent that the forces of King Wafloth were on the wane, and, barring miracles, disaster, defeat, and despair were the only comforts remaining to them. Helgi was covered from helmet to toe guard with the mud of blood and dust, some of which was his own. Directly on landing from a none too kind voyage from Iceland, he had marched with this army through ice and snow for ten days, with only weekends and Odin to stay afternoons free for sport. He threw himself into the thick of the battle before the ink on his arrival card was dry and had been thrust, parry and slashing on a continuous basis for seven or more hours. I am beginning to have my doubts about this job. Finding nests for immigrant Turkish turtle doves might be dull work, but at least the tea breaks are regular. King Werther's men were making mincemeat of the opposition and were already looking forward to an early evening dismissal. Wafflaus men sensed that the battle was going against them and that this was the time to do something desperate. In one last glorious thrust, those warriors bold advanced against their foe. In perfect unison, they mimed a play by Ibsen, indicating punctuation with strokes of the axe and sword. By the seventh act, Wafflaus Vikings had leveled scores of Werther's warriors, most of them succumbing to fatal boredom. We better put the time yeah. back up. Looks like it's going to be extra time. Extra time? I will use this opportunity to gain favour with the king. Perhaps then he will let me marry his youngest daughter. Halt! You see, I bear this silver platter laden with segments of fine orange fruit from the far orient to refresh the warriors of the great King Werther. I didn't give you permission to come on. That's a penalty. Unauthorized entry to field of battle. Penalty against Werther's side. Werther's men to retreat 15 yards. Wolfloff's men get the fruit. The squire to be fed to the dogs. No! What's this called when it's at home? It's called an orange. You stick it in your mouth and suck it. It refreshes you. It's called an orange. You stick it in your mouth and suck it. It refreshes you. Go on. Whatever will I think of next? Lemons. Lemons. Lemons? What's them? Same thing, different colour. Too bitter to suck. Same thing, different colour, 
too bitter to suck. Not like this battle then, hey. This brief respite was almost over when a mighty rushing sound was heard approaching from the north. galaxy of sparks and with retro rockets on full thrust, the watcher's spaceship ploughed into the ground and skidded to a stop at the edge of the battleship. Mass hysteria followed, and when the door opened and four motorcycles came roaring out, soldiers scurried for shelter toward every point of the compass. The only ones remaining were the dead, the dying, and Helgi, who was feeling none too well either. Helgi was piled so high around with conquered corpses that he had left no avenue for escape. One of the watchers gunned his machine over to where Helgi stood. Well, I have to admit that I've never seen a suit of armor like that before, and I am at a loss to guess where the weak spots might be. However, let's try this for size. How do you know my name? Come on, three. This is Amsterdam, and I've just heard that Magnus B is back in Oslo. So let's go. It's only a few hundred years from here. Wow! Who are you? And what are you doing here? I would have thought that a more relevant question was, what are you doing here, killing all these other people? That's war. What for? We have No. Why? Uh, the reason never became clear. What do you mean? War is forevermore? Why not? I am the dirt in my jeans. Uh, I don't understand what's going on. We are representatives of the center of pre-dominion. Huh? Like robots from cosmic control. We race around the universe, sorting out the birds in the ground plan. You might as well be sons of the sun for all I know. By the looks of it, your longship is of Hakla's kin. The truth is that the truth is too colossal for your tiny mind to comprehend it. By the way, Helgi, your cousin couldn't stand it any longer at his wife's house, so he has recovered enough to want his job back. You may as well return to Iceland. Take some sheep with you. Lamb's meat will be a welcome alternative to fish. Decadence, mumbled Helgi, but stuffed a spare flock into his rucksack anyway. A windy hilltop overlooking a recent field of battle in Norway. You roll up the sleeping bag, camel, whilst I pack my pens. How come I always get the heavy jobs, darling? Natural law and Knesset decree. I see. 
They're never gonna believe this back in Babylon. And this is the end of the story, which tells of the first meeting between Helgi and Fallowfield.
De stilte voordat we beginnen. De stilte voordat we beginnen. De stilte voordat we beginnen. I shouldn't be telling you this, but this story is too good to keep to myself. The saga of Brian the Rove and the scoring technique in Cribbage. Part 1 The Abduction and Passage to Iceland. Ace high, high count. Brianne is at home. The storyteller has just left. Brianne is the son of one of Aaron's kings. Brianne's father has his own house band. Brianne's home is on the edge of the island. The logs fetched up by the sea nearby provide warmth enough to see them through the winter months. Brianne's island, like most, is fine when the weather is fine and a bloody misery after the third week of continuous rain. For if you've seen one raindrop, you've seen them all. It's quite different with a drop of pond water now. Every one of those is worthy of at least 15 minutes of any microscope owner's time. Brian's mother, the Queen, is out with the girls chasing down wild boar for sport and the pantry, whilst his father, the King himself, is playing his harp loudly as the three mates make the bed around him. Three. Fifteen for two. Fifteen. Twenty-two. 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 Twenty-seven. Twenty-nine. Thirty-one for two goes four. Brian's sister, Nolkorka has heard the story previously and has therefore gone early to her bed. It is raining close to where Brian sits, outside against the castle wall, and he would certainly be getting wet to the skin were it not for the roof over his head. Beneath this lean-to the storyteller tells and learns on every other Saturday afternoon and evening. Inside Brian's head thoughts weave internal tapestry, destiny emblazoned by a conspiracy of doubt. Here is a prince who will become a king. Here is a poet who will become a priest. Brian is so internally occupied, he fails to discern the approach of mail and armour. Hey there! Do you mean to tell me we walked all this way up from the beach and now there's nothing here but this? Says one of the Vikings 
as he pats Brienne heartily on the shoulder. Well, there's one here fit for slavery, answers the leader of the group, and he brushes Ernst's hand from Brienne's shoulder with an expressive sword blade. Well, he looks like a prince to me, says Ern. Who would you expect to live in such a stone-built place, Ern? A fisherman? A weather forecaster, perhaps? Anyway, I have yet to meet a prince who cannot be trained to cut hay or haul nets. Ern laughs and cuts a chunk out of the door upright before crossing the threshold. Immediately, he comes back out pats Brienne on the shoulder twice more and laughs again but heartier before going back inside. Þú, stertur, kjóstu, gerast minn trætl eða hljóta eitt koss aksar minnar. Well now, I'm a free spirit to see, and I don't mind telling you, I'm not much interested in leaving here where I've got a good right now with the future even brighter cousins permitting. Kom þú, nú rauðhaus, með í heiskap og réttir á Íslandi. I'm the last to see him alive. From my window I see a man leading him away. His hands are tied behind his back. His ankles tightly hobbled. His captor has led him to a low hawthorn tree and binds him securely to it. Now, with the arrogance of a fisherman, who feels no need to check the security of his knots, he returns in this direction. Yet, before that man can cross the boundary of the moon shadow cast by the outer wall, there is another knocking at my door. Cousins from cousins from 
Extremely tired of this rowing activity. Is there not enough wind for the sail? Tja, if you wish, you can drag up the sail. You can make it work for that. And if there is no wind to the sail, then you can go to the sail and ride the sail. That's the There's no darkness of night in Iceland during the summer. When do you sleep? Þegar ég er þreyttur, þér þegar sagt. The end of part one. Fifteen two, fifteen four, pairs six and six is twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Really? No, I think you got more. Count again. Fifteen, 15 two, two, fifteen, fifteen four, four, a pair is six. six. And six is twelve. Yuck. I win! Oh, you're a bad loser. <laughs> in The Saga of Brian the Roth and the Scoring Technique in Cribbage by Rod Summers, the cast was as follows Brian, Wally, Melkauka, Daisy Fortune, and Omar IC, Scooter Helgerson. Brian Gawley, Lisbeth Summers Ewalds, and Rod Summers were the narrators, and the band was Morning Cure from a 1981 VEC recording. Icelandic text adaptation was by Scooter Helgerson, and the recording and sound balance were by Rod Summers, with additional recording by Tom Winter. The saga of Brian the Roth and the scoring technique in Cribbage was a VEC sound production directed by Rod Summers. <laughs>